you got him for a breast. Often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest show on dirt, the world of outlaws. This is the original eSport racing game. This is iRacing. While other drivers have tried to muscle their way to the top, last week we saw Acosta outthink everyone. Letting those ahead of him fight it out, once the pit stops were done at Road America, Abner was gone. But the real challenge down here in Georgia might not be the strategy so much as how close our drivers dare to flirt with the edge. Road Atlanta has a habit of punishing anyone for small infractions with the track limits. Will our frontrunners be left spitting out red Georgia clay? We'll find out soon as we get ready to watch round four of the PRL GTE Sports Car Series. And you'll see it all live here on the Global Sim Racing Channel and the iRacing Esports Network. Hi, I'm Joe Peak, and with me in the booth is Christian Challoner. Behind the scenes is our director, Sean Crackers Ambrose, and he's using cameras provided by Dougie Beer. Christian, I often feel like this track is underrated in terms of North American circuits. It really seems to take no prisoners if you make a mistake. Yeah, that's definitely true. There's a lot of places here which they seem like they're easy right up until they're not, essentially. There's a lot, of tr a lot of tricky fast corners where the limits, if you just step over them a little bit, you'll find yourself on the wall really quickly. It's a just over two and a half mile track with 12 turns, and it's going to be a 60 minute race tonight with one pit stop because of fuel restriction. And I will now hand you over to the lap guide. All right, we've got Taylor Burris in the GSRC 4GT, so let's do a lap around Road Atlanta. Coming down to turn one, this is a frighteningly fast corner. You might still see some brave passes into here, but a mishap tends to end your day quickly. From there, you'll try to line yourself up over the blind crest of two and set up for three. Knowing your turn-in point will be tricky and require great precision. After that, you'll hug the inside of four to set yourself up for the S's. The racing through this valley should be pretty much single file all day. Otherwise, you're taking an incredible risk. Turn five sees a lot of unforced errors, and most drivers pay for it in bodywork with how little runoff there is on either side. Finally, you get a short breather up to six, which has more camber than you'd expect. That makes it tough to overtake here, and honestly, it's better to set yourself up for seven anyways. This is the most critical corner of the circuit with it leading you onto the backstretch. Fail to get a good launch on the exit, and you'll find yourself very vulnerable to attack. 
You see, it's not just the slipstream that offers your opponents a good opportunity. It's the fact that the turn 10 chicane is one of the heaviest braking zones of the lap. For the layman, that means a majority of the passes you'll see will take place here. So if the other driver doesn't get it done on the straight, they're likely to try to beat you to the apex when you get on the binders. From off the corner, you'll already start aiming the car across the crest and under the bridge. From there, it's very marginal getting through the final corner, which is another really dangerous turn. But hopefully you've kept it together and have now finished the lap around Road Atlanta. These GTE cars, the laps are going to go by very quickly, just a quarter of a minute over a minute uh, that they run laps around here, the fast drivers. But as always, today's race is brought to you by Simsa. Simulation Motorsports Affinity provides many consulting services from completely customizing simulators to managing teams, individual drivers, and complete events. They're working hard to bring organizations, companies, manufacturers, teams, and drivers together at one place to support and promote sim racing internationally. They're also bridging virtual and real motorsports by providing a network between these two, involving sim racers, real drivers, teams, managers, engineers, and of course, motorsport fans alike. You can find out more about how you can get involved at simsa.net. Today's broadcast is also proudly sponsored by Butt Kicker. Butt Kicker products create an incredible immersion and realism to every game. Feel every nuance and truly put yourself in the driver's seat. The winner of Division 1 here on the PRL GTE Sports Car Series will also get a Butt Kicker Gamer 2 or a simulation kit. Also, both drivers of the winning team and the team's championship will get a free t-shirt. Check them out at thebuttkicker.com. Let's take a look at that championship. First, uh, ducking over to the drivers, uh, see who is going to be uh, getting that simulator kit potentially. Abner Acosta has been on a good tear with two wins out of the first three rounds, but Diaz has been close behind. He falls back a little bit with his poor result comparatively last week. Uh, Christian Eisler has been consistent, but yet to win this season. Then, of course, got David Holland and Leif Peterson bringing consistency to the fore, but needs some higher up finishes to really be in the mix. What about the team's championship? There's some T-shirts on the line for this one, Christian. Yeah, and the team championship's got an equally close fight at the top with just one point separating Obsidian Racing and Punto CL Racing. V-Power Racing and RSR Esport a little bit further back, but they've got their own battle going on for third and fourth there with just seven points separating them. And then further back again, but hanging on to that fifth place spot, we've got one sim, MSGTR White. Love to see these close battles up at the top, especially with how powerful Obsidian's been lately. Let's take a look at what this race itself will entail. Uh, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, we are in round four, and they do get one drop week in those points. You can't afford to have a poor race, but not many. Uh, there's four different makes that they have to choose from in these GTE cars. So it is a 60-minute race, as Christian said, with one scheduled pit stop in that open setup. Uh, the incident cap at 20 means that you can be disqualified if you abuse those track limits too often. And you can see the bonus points listed down there at the bottom which with how close things have been, that could also affect the championship uh, between our top runners. As always, we want to thank you for tuning in here to the iRacing Esports Network. While you're here, why don't you think about subscribing? If you haven't yet, you'll know it because you'll see a big red button that says subscribe. Click that, you won't miss a moment here on the IESN. Qualifying has been going on, and Diaz is back on the pole once again. But instead, a different name than we're used to seeing up at the front. Christopher Pfeiffer is uh, up there on the front row. But the driver who has taken a championship in this series, Jesper Derlicka, is back after a period away. So we'll see if the 97 can do much. But otherwise, this is looking uh, not especially tight between the pole sitter and the rest, but those behind him there, Christian, look like they're finding little between them. Yeah, the pole sitter's got quite a significant advantage right now, about two tenths, and I have to wonder if he didn't get a really good toe with the with, with the open qualifying down the back stretch because he picked up a lot from his practice pace. But all the way from second down to tenth is within half a second, which is really impressive. It's a really tight battle there. And Abner Acosta joins his teammate, but he's still second behind Diaz. In fact, uh, just under those two tenths behind him, less than a tenth ahead of Pfeiffer, which bumps him to the second row. This is Munoz that we've got on screen. He gets demoted down to fifth with that new arrival up at the top. 
He's actually coming around to complete another lap. His quickest was his first to the 15, five, nine, six. Let's see if this one can be a little bit faster as he comes down the hill. And actually looking at his current lap, this looks like it might be an out lap, honestly. So yes, indeed, that one didn't count. So he'll have to come around for another try. He's got about five and a half minutes left to go. Checking in on Borda as well. Down in 34th. This is way far down compared to what we're used to seeing with him. Excuse me, 24th it looks like. Just as he crosses the line, he goes faster, but only up to 20th. Fernando Borda, who was challenging for the win at one point last race, seems to be struggling here. In fact, he's struggling off into the runoff as we check on uh, Semkovic as well. James LeBlanc down in 22nd, comes across the line, uh, but does not go faster that time by. Yeah, and this, this could be quite interesting here because the long straight really does kind of play into the, the hands of, say, the Ferrari and the BMW. They're very strong down the straights especially, but they do have a tendency to wear their tires a little bit more than the Porsche and the Ford. So even though the Porsche and Ford are maybe a little bit slower on a hot lap, it, it'll be interesting to see if those guys can move through the field as, as the tires wear out on the BMW and the Ferrari. Bad news for those here is that Diaz and Acosta finished on the podium last year or last season i should say for the second for acosta and a third for diaz so they're probably going to continue their strength this season it seems and the driver that beat them to the top spot was Felipa, who is not here today and in fact hasn't been back this season at all romig continuing on holland so let's see if he can improve he was uh in the top 10 last race and he's just outside of it this race now bumping himself up to 11th with that lap talked about the drivers or the different makes of cars having different strengths and this track being a little bit unique they've got that long stretch but there's also uh, some really technical portions around this lap but I'm not sure that those technical portions offer much in the way of trying to, to overtake so I mean is it really a case where you want to set the car up for for top end around here well so that's kind of the problem is because you'll always get a lap time benefit really from going for more downforce but you'll struggle a lot in the race to actually clear people especially down that back stretch if you do that so it'll be interesting to see if this guy if these guys have kind of gone a different way between those those two options and what people are doing in in both scenarios whether people have gone for kind of a, a trimmed out race set versus a qualifying setup and especially with the with the slower cars down the straight so the Porsche and the Ford and so on it can get very frustrating to be following a BMW or a Ferrari, especially through the high-speed S's where you've maybe got a little bit of performance on them and then you'll watch them pull away down the straight again. So it, it might be frustrating for those guys, but they just kind of have to keep with the knowledge that they'll be better later on in the run and, and not, not get too involved in a fight too early on. I'm not sure what, it looks like Diaz maybe trying to get himself some clear track here. We were watching him up to the chicane, letting a lot of cars by. This is Enriquez sitting in 12th. Let's see if he can improve on that 16 flat. Nope, looks like that lap unfortunately didn't count for him. We were watching Garrido a bit ago. He's in ninth position and he is going to be coming around. He's only got one lap time down here in his qualifying, so he's got to start getting some clean ones in. He's down in ninth. And he started on row two last week. Unfortunately, his tangle with Diaz denied him a better result. Let's see if he can maybe have a little bit of a cleaner race here today. He's got about a minute and some, so two more laps potentially on the card. He does go quicker this time by about three tenths. And that's good enough for row two once again. Fourth place for the 317. That was a good lap there and really kind of pulled it out when he needed to. And that's interesting to mention about the clean laps. There's a lot of places on this track where you can overstep, not even not even really a lot to gain a lot of lap time, but just enough to, to trip that kind of off-track limit. And obviously with qualifying, you only, you only cl count clean laps, so it's important to get a good lap in to start with and then kind of amp up how much you're going to cut the track and, and maybe try and improve once you've already got a good time down. One of the spots that we'll be keeping an eye on that uh, could cost drivers not just laps and qualifying but in the race is up at turn five christian 
in all my years of covering here on GSRC, that is the corner I feel like I've seen take more people out on this track than any other place around here. I mean, for our audience that hasn't driven around here, explain what is so tough about that corner. It, it draws you into using a lot of the outside on exit because you can carry way more speed if you if you run the car hard through there and and then obviously you've got the straight afterwards so you're you're drawn into you're drawn into pushing the limit there and what tends to happen is you'll you'll go out wide and you'll be like yeah this is okay this is fine we're doing all right and then all of a sudden you'll go over a huge bump and it'll kick the back of the car around and especially in these downforce dependent cars they they get really unsettled by that and it's very easy to just get fired off into the wall and we've seen plenty of those drivers off into the wall before as the checkered flag comes out so qualifying now over Horatio Cal Quinn jumps up to 17th with his final lap across the line. I see Diaz, who currently holds the pole, still at the same gap of about 0.17 of a second over Abner Acosta, his teammate. He's going to abandon his last lap, so it doesn't feel a need to try and improve his time. Pfeiffer, who was in third, was following him. Pfeiffer also does not improve, though. Slow down, not sure why he decided to back off. Federico Montini comes across and goes up to 15th with that lap. James LeBlond, his last one, his quickest at 116.2. That jumps him up to, into 22nd position. Not quicker for Pisano uh, beside, excuse me, behind him rather. And I think Mitchell going to be the last one. Oh, I see Abner Acosta actually out there. He's in second. The teammate to Diaz, his championship rival. Let's see what he's got. It's a 15-3 at his quickest right now. And a 15-4, just a tenth shy. That'll be the last car across the line here today. So round four has the grid settled. It's time to go through our starting grid here for the PRL GTE Sports Car Series. Michael Diaz has managed to put on the pole once again. That's a bonus point for him. And Abner Acosta will be starting next to him. Can Diaz finally get back up front? He hasn't won since round one. Christopher Pfeiffer is starting in third. Diego Ignacio Portel Garrido will be P4 with Jesper Derlicka returning with a nice fifth place. He could maybe pull one over on these guys. He has a master at saving fuel. Luis Henriquez will be in sixth with Paolo Munoz in seventh position. Christian Eisler down in eighth, row four for him. He was doing a little bit better last round at Road America. Lucas Vasi, uh, Vasi Galupo is starting in P9, and Lee Peterson rounds out your top 10. Just outside the top 10 in 11th, we've got Anthony Pisano and David C. Holland, the only guys in the 15 eights. Then on row seven after that, we got Fernando Borda and Ignacio Rodriguez. Rodrigo Montini and Timothy Hargo from 15th and 16th. Uh, Horatio Calquin and Jeff Carollo in 17th and 18th. Elijah Mitchell, we saw him just completing his lap right at the end of the session there. Only good enough for 19th, unfortunately for him. And then Ted Lowendick in 20th. Brett Thurman will be starting P21. James Wand will be next to him in 22nd. The row after has Sean Grombig to the inside in 23rd. Jonathan Ulmer in 24th. Sean Duhamel starts in 25th, then it is Joey Trungale in 26th spot. Jose Malbron starts 27th, Kenneth Rodriguez in 28th. Donnie Olson will be on the inside of row 15 in 29th, and Spencer Zemkovich managed 30th. And then the last of the field is Mark File in 31st, Stacey Dunnigan in 32nd, Gary Schilling in 33rd. The last card to get a lap in was Francisco Yaniselli. James Hebb, uh, let's see, does not appear to be in the session, so I don't believe he will be starting the race. Looks like we're going to have a 34 car field here today. Thankfully, not a standing start. They're going to get a rolling start behind the pace car. You can see just how long the field is uh, going up the hill around here, and eventually they will plunge down that hill for the green flag. The start might be a little bit worrisome, though, Christian. I've seen a lot of drivers go into that turn one just a little bit too hard. Yeah, and that's really the thing is that there's a, there's a big stack up effect, especially when you get to the top of the hill as well, even if you do make it through turn one. And I know myself has, uh, has made that mistake, I wish you'd say, where I've maybe approached the corner thinking, hey, everybody's getting through here quite nice, only to find all of a sudden everybody is stopped. And... It's very difficult for the guys in the midfield to predict that, and you just kind of have to 
just really roll through the corners and just kind of build yourself a little bit of a gap to the car in front. But at the same time, you don't want to lose any track position. So you do have to push, but you do have to be aware that there is that pinch point and that everybody is going to have to be single file as they go through the S's. Let's we'll see how they handle that when they come around the next time. They're uh, partly single file here as they follow the pace car. Let's take a look at the weather while we got the opportunity. 82 degrees Fahrenheit on the track surface with a nice cool 70 degrees for the virtual fans. So relatively good conditions for our drivers. A little bit of a breeze uh, at 10 miles an hour. You talked about these being high downforce cars. I don't, wouldn't think that's enough to really affect them. Would, would it be, Christian? I can't say that I've particularly noticed it in the GTE cars. But I have noticed that the wind effects in, say, things like the, the Indy cars and the LMP cars and so on, it, do, it does affect them quite substantially. The biggest thing I can think that that might play in is if that wind turns and is a headwind down the back stretch. That could really make the draft uh, very powerful and make it very, not easy, but very possible to execute a pass into the chicane. Spot where we expect most of the pass passes to happen they're coming up to now as the uh, pace car takes them down that long winding back stretch up and down hills sometimes they call this place the roller coaster because of the elevation changes our director likes to call it the pork chop which i personally like a little bit better just due to the outline of the track uh, but we'll see if anybody is going to be able maybe to celebrate with a victory dinner tonight after all is said and done there you go there's you can see the pork chop shape right there with our graphic as they come down the bottom of the hill into that chicane, downhill braking zone into here for these drivers really having to push it and then accelerate up and over the hill to finish the lap. We're not finishing yet. We're just starting here today for round four as the Porsche pace car peels off and Diaz is off and away with a great jump. Look at that, third place, a little bobble over the curbs, but Pfeiffer taking it away from Acosta early. Maybe that's why he slowed. He liked where he was. This is stacking them up behind him down to the inside. That is uh, Derlica trying to take it away from Garrido. A lot of cars still trying to sort it out as they come up to turn three, a danger zone. Derlica might lose out actually as he's shallow through the corner behind them. I'm not seeing any cars get together and I think they're clean. Yeah, that was quite nice by Diaz to go as early as he did. To be honest, it helped everybody spread out and get single file well before we got to turn three for the most part. Garrido did get that fourth place back away from Derlica behind them. A nice little battle with Enriquez and Basigalupo. This is for seventh position and a big bobble off at of turn seven. Enriquez exactly when he doesn't want that. He's now a sitting duck, Christian, as they come down the backstretch. Yeah, and he's got about three more cars behind him here that might actually have an opportunity, although he does look like he's kind of got back in play, and the two behind him having a fight as well is going to help him out, I think. Now that's Holland to the outside, and Peterson, interestingly, in his Porsche, backs out of it, so he relinquishes that 10th position to Holland's Ferrari. Back up over the hill, it is Diaz still leading on the first lap around across the line, ahead of not his teammate, but Pfeiffer now with Acosta trailing by a decent gap. Garrido applying pressure. Yeah, I think Pfeiffer is really one to look for in this race. He's, he's got that Porsche, which is good on tires. I think he'll be a real threat if he can hang on to the second long enough for that to come into play. He got a car off. It looks like it was Federico Montini up and through turn one. He returns in 18th position. Trying to see if he actually hit the wall in that. I think he may have come away unscathed. The replay. He's way off into the lead. And yep, he stayed away from the wall, it looks like. And yeah, a very easy mistake to make there. You just go slightly too deep into the corner and you dip the left sides off, and then it almost feels like the grass falls away on the exit of that corner, and you just end up going off for miles, and it, it really takes you a long time to get back to the track. Looks like the Ferrari from that angle snapped a little bit on him. So I wonder if he was trying to catch it, and that's why he ran out of track. Meanwhile, as we come back live, let's go to Delica, because I think he's just going to get fifth place from Munoz, who was challenging him for that position down the back stretch. He has to set up and try again. They come across the line to start another lap now. Yeah, Delica with that forward that's not really not very fast at all down the straights, but it's an absolute demon through the S's here. 
Hopefully for him he can get get away a little bit so that he's got a little more space next time he gets to that back stretch. See, just in front of them, we're catching flashes of Abner Acosta continuing to have to deal with a mirror full of Burrito. This is for the final podium spot. Burrito again was one of the drivers in contention for the win, fighting for it. Last round is Acosta having connection problems. Certainly not what they want to see with this close of a fight. But Garrido back and forth still has a ways to go to get himself up to the front. I feel like I had a bad exit under the straight there. He's going to lose that fifth spot. No need to go to it, but Almanar, Jonathan Almanar, unfortunately wrecked out in the back of the field as this battle continues. Munoz ahead of Derlica as he gets back in to look for that slipstream from the Ferrari ahead to side of the chicane from Munoz. Nothing doing on the first part. Could he set himself up for a better exit off the second part? The answer looks like no. Yeah, this is going to hurt now because I feel like Relicka actually had a really good pace, but he made that mistake and now he's behind the Ferrari and everywhere he's strong, he's not going to be able to use that. Twisty bits start. Let's see if that blue Ford starts to close in. And indeed, you can see the gap ahead. It's small as about a car length and a half. It points good under braking up into turn five as he tries to get aggressive but starts to fall away once again over this crest. Munoz still safe in this P5. And I think he's got a big enough gap here that he's going to be able to get down the straight without really being under much threat. A pretty decent exit from Derlicka off the corner. He's staying close. The blue oval still filling the mirrors of Munoz. And he's starting to gain. Oh, he might have something here. He's going to go down on the left side, the I think. He's been given the inside even. I'm surprised that Munoz left the door open. He gets through at the apex. Hand P5 back to the 97. I'm wondering if Munoz just kind of realized... Um, what I was thinking, that Relic is faster and that you can actually use him to tow him up to the cars ahead. Ooh, look at this action behind them, though, coming down the hill. On the front stretch, this is Hargrave ahead of Lowendick. Takes a little duck to the inside. So does Mitchell behind them. All breaking into turn one. Almost a chain reaction. Even LeBlond and Romig also poking their noses out, seeing if there's anything on the cards. They all recording in together and then stretch apart out of three and back down the hill into the valley. And this is kind of what I was mentioning a little bit about the BMW. It's very quick down the straights, which makes it very hard to pass, but it's not really that great through the corners. The more recent BOP kind of hurt it a little bit, and it's not as good on its tires as it once was. So that's why we've got this stack of cars building up behind it here. We had a car stacked into the tires. Unfortunately, Joey Trungale who is now taking a toe. He's in, scored in 32nd. Almost looked like he speared straight off into them. Quickly look, take a look at the replay. This is actually an odd incident. I'm not sure if he had a hardware failure or what. The Porsche looks fine here. And you see the Texas driver come up the hill into turn five and suddenly the car just stops steering yeah that definitely looks like he might have had a hardware problem there as we come back live we're on this battle between peterson henriquez borda and fredes oh and way wide off into the corner borda is going to hand this position away that'll be for sure a slowdown penalty for him fred is now promoted to 13 through that just managing to sneak between Cal Quinn and Corolo. Looks like he's still trying to serve the penalty a little bit, though. It looks like he's good now as we come back to the replay. Saw the mistake from the forward ahead. Thought maybe he could get into it and then maybe just a little bit unsighted there. Yeah, it looked like he maybe looked to the outside for a move and kind of realized it wasn't going to come off and it. As much as it hurts to take the slowdown, it is always better to kind of just commit to using the runoff, and that way you at least keep your car clean and you get to, you get to fight another day. You see Borda looking now, Cal Quinn ahead of him, and he's looking pretty strong, actually. 
Ford versus Ferrari. That's going to be a theme we're going to hear a lot lately with a movie coming out around that. And we, did, we have another big incident. We did multiple cars. Jose Malbron down in 27th with Federico Montini. Let's take a look at the replay. This is into the chicane, and I think Montini outbreak himself or... Ooh. That's hard to tell, really, who's to blame on that one. Yeah, the chicane does kind of promote the crossover, and it can quite easily go wrong. Yeah, and he, it looks like maybe he that's what he was trying, is to chop in front of the car, and he wasn't clear. Unfortunately, both of them wound up in the gravel due to that. Both sent to nearly the back of the field. Let's head over to the lead because we haven't checked on Diaz in a while and Pfeiffer who hasn't really been making attempts at a, at a pass yet is still within half a second of that Ferrari now instead of his teammate uh, back there to help him it's Dorito instead of Acosta in third Dorito staying within about a second himself though I'm not sure that uh, he's been gaining since we last looked yeah, it looks like it is kind of sort of moving a bit towards the Porsche here, but maybe it's slightly too soon for the for there to be a significant advantage that way. I have been watching Garrido though, and he has been closing up just a little bit, so he's probably going to get into this fight soon. And that's what Diaz probably wants, but Pfeiffer does not, as they come up to turn seven. Oh no, and Porta with more issues. Let's take a look at what exactly went down here. Oh, you know what? It's almost a carbon copy here. As you're going to see, once they come up to turn three, he takes to the runoff. And another slowdown penalty here for another green Ford. It looks like he's really struggling with that chicane. Well, I say chicane. I've always kind of thought of it as a chicane at the top of the hill, though. <laughs> Ooh, you were, you were right about Garrido. He's now down to half a second. Pfeiffer, though, is is got down to three-tenths of a second on Diaz. Everybody's closing in on the leader now. Right on board with Diego. Up the hill over that blind crest. And then back down through four and into the S's. I'm wondering how much these guys are thinking about fuel safety here. The Porsche is really good on fuel as well as tires. And the more you can kind of just sit behind someone and let them tow you along, you can save a significant amount, especially at a track like this where you've got these, the long back stretch and a, a number of long straights, actually. So I'm wondering if Pfeiffer was just thinking he could kind of sit there, but now the battle's come to him anyway. You can see Hardgrave getting back on the track. He got turned around in turn one, and I think he had help. Ted Lowendick to his inside. You're going to see... They come down here into the first turn, and unfortunately, it's like Lone Dick had put his nose in and just a, the lightest of touches. That's all it takes, especially through that corner where everything's so on edge. Oof, he hit the hard, the the inside wall hard, unfortunately, with that. Oh, we got to go back to the lead, though. Because it is now down to two tenths of a second between all three cars as they break for turn one. Diaz, your leader, Pfeiffer in second, Garrido in third. It's interesting that you mentioned the fuel saving because the one driver that's used that is, uh, I think that's a lapped car just letting them through there, Simkovic. Uh, the one driver that's used the fuel saving to great advantage so far has been Acosta, the one hanging back and forth. Yeah, and it does look like he's just kind of getting drawn up to this fight now. He looks like he's slightly too far back to be saving fuel because of draft, though. So I'm wondering if he's going to press the issue just a little bit here to just get a touch closer. Sure, he'd love to be able to take advantage of things. If we have more of what happened last week, it was between Garrido and Diaz that came together. And there's a car separating them. <laughs> if I was Pfeiffer, I might feel a little bit nervous if they got pretty close to me. Coming down on the back stretch and into the nobody close enough to have an attempt this time at least yeah and i think pfeiffer needs to be really careful here because even though i do think that he's got the pace to to win this race he needs to 
really not lose track position for the Ferraris around him because he'll find it very difficult to repass them. We got some um, passes going on for 18th position. Romig ahead of Borda. Borda out of position, don't forget. James LeBlanc behind him, hoping to pick up the pieces if something starts to go down. Brett Thurman in there as well, all four of them across the start finish line. A quarter of the way through this race, and we've seen plenty of action and plenty of mistakes as well. Yeah, and, and I think that's only going to kind of carry on the more the tires wear. The track temperature is fairly low, which is going to help them out with that a little bit, but it's. I, I think the danger point especially on this track is right after you pit it and take them fuel because there's a lot of high speed corners that you have to commit to to get the pace out of the car and you've got old tires you've got more fuel it's the first lap is very tricky uh, that temperature has gone down a degree since the start of the race as well with it being evening time as we got a car off track there that is what is that that is uh, elijah mitchell All on his own coming through turn six. There it is right there. Off into the dirt and he couldn't bring it back on. Yeah, it's one of those corners again where you don't want to go off in the grass. The grass at this track just seems to slope away on exit of every corner. So if you get out there, it's, it's, it's a bad time trying to get back to the track. And as we watch this replay, we'll have to head over to a replay for a pass for P2. Garrido, who's been... Uh, becoming known for his aggressive oh! moves, pulls another Pfeiffer one. Pfeiffer in the wall, out of five. Well, like he got up on that curb and it just got away from him. So at first he was unceremoniously shoved out of the way by Garrido to lose second, and now, on his own mistake, wow, that, whew, he just slammed into those tires. It's so unfortunate for him. I feel like he was doing a great job in that second place, and I was kind of pulling for him. I, I always like the Porsches, so I'm sad to see him have that incident. I think he maybe was a bit upset about what happened when he got passed for second and was just pushing real hard, and yeah, talked about that corner in pre-race. It's, it's easy to have that mistake happen to you. I'm sure if we can find the replay for that pass, it'd be worth watching and see uh, exactly how Garrido did it. It was in the final corner. Seeing if we could pull that one up. But uh, here we go. I think we've got it. Diego's pulled moves like this already this season. Let's take a closer glance at this. Gets down to the inside in the chicane, then gets up beside him. Oof. It's wow. very difficult to fit two cars side by side through there. Uh. And, and as we come back live, Jesper Derlicka is off in turn five. This one, a very odd incident. He didn't lose it on his way through turn five. He lost it even before the corner. Ooh, he, he's almost hit by Munoz. So once we watch this, we should watch an onboard from Hollow because he did a great job avoiding a horrible accident. We got, not sure why he lost it through the S's there. Looked like he might have been, I don't want to say really trimmed out on aero, but maybe really high rake in the car just to get it to rotate. And it looked like it, it bit him hard as he tried to cut the car back the opposite way, and then it carried all the way through to five. I love how much Paulo slows up, trying to figure out which way is this car going to go, and eventually he's got a clear track in front of him. That uh, promotes Paulo up to fourth position. Nicely done by him, having started in seventh, but poor uh, Derlicka has fallen all the way to 14th. Ooh. Another blue forward off, and this one in turn one, Luis Henriquez. Ooh, that's a lot of curb. Yeah, he and, really, really hammered the inside curb and looked like it unsettled him. And then again, same same thing that we saw. It just snaps the other the, way. The lead, the lead changing hands right now. Garrido got a great run down the backstretch. Diaz has no response for him. And after they're coming together last race, it looks like he's willing to just give this one up this time. At least for now, he 
gets right back in behind the Ferrari ahead and gives chase. Yeah, he definitely didn't fight it down into the chicane like I thought he might. Looked like he was quite happy to just slot in behind. Through turn one, they've got quite a gap back to Diaz's teammate. It cost nearly two seconds behind. Not expecting anybody to come in for early stops, but if they want, the pit window should be opening here in a minute or two. I think the only people who might want to try an earlier stop, it's not preferable in terms of car performance because you're just going to have to run around with a heavier car for longer. But the guys who might be stuck in a train of cars, they might want to consider it just to unlock their own pace a little bit. Ooh, we had a coming together back down in the field, Hargrave in 26. Looks like he had a hard touch with Mark File into the chicane. And I think File even took a toe out of that. He must have had suspension damage. Hargrave a long ways back. Look at how far back he is. And then here when they hit the braking zone, suddenly the BMW is right next to that uh, Porsche. Not next to him, he's into the Porsche. Yeah, that was that was quite a clumsy move there. Ooh, yeah. I would not have been expecting that one either. Off into the grass and eventually sees that the car not handling as it should, so he tows it into the pits. It looks like Hargrave has since towed it as well. I'm not exactly sure what happened there. Meanwhile, back in fourth position, Munoz not out of the woods. He's had some action. He's going to get some more. Basigalupo behind him, challenging the 3 2 1. It's Ferrari versus Ferrari in this scenario. In fact, it is uh, all Ferraris, and gosh, this is, this is the top eight. Wow. That is wild. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me too much, though. I figured the Ferraris would have a bit of a pace advantage, especially for qualifying, and it did look that way. It, this track just kind of plays to that car's strengths, especially down the straights. On board with Holland, he manages to get by Eisler. And through the chicane, promote David Holland up to six. Eisler down to seventh with that action. That is Pisano behind them that you see as we ride on board with Holland looking back. And this is the field has been jumbled around a lot there, Christian. Sorry. Yeah, there's there's been some. I I don't want to say major mistakes because there's a lot of people who've had errors that have dropped them back, but they're still going. They haven't they haven't hurt their cars. But I think in this kind of scenario here, where you've got three really close to each other and maybe maybe not the fastest car at the head of the line, that it might be worth one of the guys behind pitting just one or two laps early just to see if he can't undercut them a little bit. That's a good point because Holland did qualify in 12. Now hard to say if that's just a bad qualifying for him or just he got these positions by attrition and now he might have to hand them back as they have faster pace or not but Eisler's still with him as they come down the back stretch. Not sure that the draft's going to be strong enough for him to have a go down into the chicane. In fact, he's going to stay in line. So is Pisano behind him. Our first non-Ferrari is uh, Leif Peterson, I believe, in, ten, in ninth right now. He is, right? Driving the Porsche. And they've got two more Ferraris before you get to the next one, which is Corolla in 12. Right on board with our leaders looking back at Diaz. Wonder if maybe this is what Diaz is thinking is, is fuel. Let let Garrido by, let him tow him along, and just uh, see if he can sneak one by when they come in for the pit stops. It definitely looked like he wasn't concerned by the fact that he'd been passed. It looked like he was quite content to ride behind him for a little bit. Now, obviously with the straights, you can save a decent amount of fuel, but I feel like, I feel like Garrido was already saving a lot of fuel because he... He wasn't the leader, and Diaz, oh, Diaz is actually looking for a move now. Pulls back into line. 
He was almost there, but that looked a little marginal. He thinks better of it. But look at him tuck up under that rear spoiler up and over the hill. They've been my marginally caught by Abner Acosta, who's now down to 1.4 seconds. There's another good run down the front stretch. Does he try it here? Nope, not willing to risk it into turn one. I feel like that's a, it's a, it's a possible move to do, but it's very, very, very tricky and very dangerous to try and let the passes in the wrong. It's the kind of thing you only do right towards the end of a race, I feel. And they're not even halfway through yet. Costa really starting the game now. It's 1.1 second up ahead. Is this Abner's time to go? I'm wondering if that's why we're seeing Diaz making a bit more of a, a push here now. Like I said, he was obviously content to drop back to second and maybe save a little bit, but with, with Acosta being brought into this fight now, it might make more sense to just try and regain the lead and try and pull away a little bit. Putting a lap on Yaniselli, both of them looking for the toe. Diaz a lot closer this time, ah, but another lift. And he pulls back in line. Yeah, this is looking more and more like Diaz isn't all that interested in making a move unless it's a sure thing. In sixth position, you got a little bit of a train. Holland being followed by Eisler, being followed by Pisano, and now Lee Peterson, who we were talking about, the first of the non-Ferraris, is in the mix. But you watched this group earlier once Holland had gotten by Eisler, and since then, the 727 has not been able to retaliate. Now, this is where if I was if I was Leif Peterson, I'd think about when I got to the back of that last Ferrari in line, then I would think about pitting. Because we thought that the Porsche has this tire and fuel advantage anyway. And I, I feel like he definitely has the potential to jump all three of these cars if he can get to the back of the last one before he pits. Just after that halfway mark, if he wants to split it up evenly, you can stay on board, but just a heads up that Acosta has cut the gap now down to 0.6 of a second to Diaz. Diaz with another run. Does he actually try it this time? No, he does not. He continues to try to get into the head of the 317. He's repeatedly ducked away. Oh, and has Derlicka had more problems? He's had big problems. This is almost a clogged track. That was Romig. Uh, we might want to stick with this before we go to replay because we got a lot of drivers all taking various lines down the backstretch. How is this going to sort out? We could have another issue because we might go three wide, and that is Corolla Oof. looking for the middle. He decides better of it. Romig to the inside, looking to outbreak Derlicka, the former champion, outbreaks himself, and he goes across the track. But Romig also a little bit difficult through that corner. Now that means Corolla could have a chance. He gets to the inside, coming down the hill, side by side through the corner. Momentum swings almost back in favor of Romig. Still door to door as they come up to turn one. LeBlanc behind them looking to see if maybe there's an advantage to be had with both of them coming together and they do actually bang doors up through turn one now breaking for three Corolla looks like he's finally got it settled i don't know i don't think that's over i think we get to the back stretch and we're going for a, a replay of this all over again up and through turn five Corolla pulls himself a little bit of a buffer romig behind him still trailing don't forget about LeBlond. He's got Mitchell now looking back and forth as they plunge through turn six. And that is Thurman at the tail of this five car train. Onto the back stretch once more. A little bit more orderly though this time, Christian. Yeah, no too wide this time, but there's definitely gonna be opportunities, I think, in this line. As this is happening, I can tell you that Eisler has gotten beside Holland, but I think he's not going to be able to make the pass. In fact, no, he has not. That was for sixth position. Down into the chicane, they're all going to stay single file in this group. And we're kind of seeing this around around the whole track and around pretty much just these groups of cars that are forming up together. There's not really anybody out there who's running completely on their own. It just seems to be packs of cars, but they get they get stuck together, and then we have these huge fights. Let's stay with this, but you know, speaking of packs of cars, Garrido, Diaz, and Acosta are now very much all together 
I'll break in if those three start fighting, but thus far they seem to be content to just race in the line. Again, we're watching that battle for 13th position. Corolla, is that lap traffic they're coming up to? But no, it's not. Sorry, I thought I saw a car ahead of them. Borda is a little ways up, but quite a gap. Oh, and we got to go back to the lead. As Diaz was getting close down into turn one, but still just trying to psychologically wear down the car, the driver of Diego Garrido. I can only think that Diaz is is very marginal on making an extra lap on it with his current fuel number, and that's why he's not going for these moves. Because we've seen him down the backstretch a lot of times. He could he's definitely close enough to, to make a passing attempt. But he just pulls out of it at the last second, so I, I feel he's he's definitely focused on something and it's it's gotta be fuel related, I think. Almost wonder if maybe he's kind of testing the waters, seeing what he can with the draft if it comes down to a late race pass whatever strategy he's working on fuel doesn't work out he does have to overtake to take the win to ride on board with his teammate Acosta let's not forget that Acosta also could be saving fuel he's been very skilled at that and now that he's riding in third he's getting a double toe he's not ready to come in quite yet and that, that will actually help Diaz a little bit, knowing that he's got his teammate behind him and not not maybe somebody else. And that might be why we're not seeing him press for this pass, because he, he's he got some kind of agreement going on that maybe they're, they're not going to fight until they've, they've cleared Diego here. Yeah, certainly a new rival in the mix since the first few rounds. Diego proving that not only has he got the speed, but he's starting to get better consistency He's not been uh, freed of his demons yet. He, of course, had his crash at Road America last round. He's got 30 minutes left to go to try and keep the car whole and finally take his first victory of the season. This is the closest we've seen Diaz off the corner. They are going to get a nice pull from Semkovic ahead, who stays to the side, doesn't want to get involved. This time, a defensive move from Garrido, interestingly. He's off to the left side. This is different from what we've seen before. Diaz breaking a little bit early and pulling back in line once more. Yeah, and I'm really kind of confused by that. I'm unsure why Diaz went to the outside. Ooh, Jeff Carolla with all his great battling. It's all come to naught, and once again, it's turn five. Keeps biting them. One by one, they've been chopped down. This one bounced them around, unfortunately. So that was that has got to be severe damage. He's going to want to have to come in, get that repaired, I'm sure. And it's going to really hurt down the back stretch to have any kind of aero damage here. Let's see, he gets it going under its own power, so he didn't have to take a tow. He's actually coming up to the pits now. They, ooh, man, yeah, the. The rear wing is not looking healthy. He knows it. He pulls into the pits. They do not have a spare car in this series, so he's either going to have to pay the price in speed or in time by getting this fixed. I'm wondering if he's just made the decision that he can get to the end from here on fuel and just, just pit now and, and kind of take a look at it and at least see if he might want to continue. We're watching Diaz doing exactly what he's been doing for multiple laps now. Just hunting the likes of Diego Garrido. This is this is one of the most menacing races I've ever seen Diaz run. For him to just, it's it's not something where he sticks in behind him, Christian, and he, he stays in his tire tracks and, and, you know, rides the slipstream. He's been trying to, he's been making it look like he's been going for a move. It's almost like he really is trying to see if he can psych out Diego. Yeah, and that's the thing, that all, all the moves he's kind of, he's sort of positioned his car as though he's going to make make moves, but they're definitely not ones he's committing to because they're, they're really half-hearted. And I... I don't think that he has any intention really of passing, so I, I can only think he's trying to force a mistake whilst trying to save some fuel. 
Looks like something happened with uh, Enriquez and Lowendick to swap positions as a couple cars give them a few more. They went into pit ahead of them. This happened down. Ooh, yeah, look at this start to erupt on the back stretch. That's Enriquez in the blue Ford that you see. The black Ferrari is Lowendick. Both of them go in deep. And it is Enriquez who manages to come out on top. Yeah, and a good move there in the in the Ford versus the Ferrari, especially especially down the back stretch. You see the Ford's pretty good on the brakes. Oh, and what happened to Lowendick here that he's missing the complete hood of that Ferrari? That might have played a factor in why the Ford was able to pass as easily as it did. <laughs> and down with Holland and Eisler. They've not finished this battle yet. But they've also caught up to Basigalupo. So now it is a battle for fifth position. Uh, ahead of them, Munoz has really stretched away. Basigalupo has had no response. There's about six and a half seconds between them. You can see the train of cars, Eisler and Pisano back there. We still haven't seen Peterson come into the pit. But he still has time in the window. Yeah, he looks like he's just not quite able to get to the back of this line. Which is unfortunate, really, because I do think he's going to have a pit stop advantage over these guys. Down the back stretch, gaining speed. Carollo staying to the inside, but that's because he is a lap down. In fact, he's going to let every single one of them through. Nicely done by Carollo. Ooh. Interesting. Abner Acosta. The first of our drivers from the top of the field to come into pit. Actually, we had three more as well, just back in that battle that we were looking at. Eisler, Pisano, and Peterson all pitted. So where is Acosta going to come out? Romig is our highest pitter right now. He himself has uh, got a train of cars with him. Acosta's back out. Looks like he's coming out into a pretty clear gap as well. That's really good. I wonder if that's why he pitted. It's possible. Maybe. You definitely don't want to get stuck. Yeah, he's he's well clear. He does have Fernando Borda ahead of him, but Borda is only a driver who hasn't pitted. He's not a back marker. He's an eighth. He should have pretty good pace. And it's not likely he'll catch them immediately. Ooh, and Eisler. Did he jump? Well, he was ahead of Pisano. No, he didn't jump anybody, it looks like because Holland didn't come in, but he is the first out. And my, my predicted advantage for Peterson in the pit stop did not materialize at all. He's coming out of the back did, of this line still. Did something happen to Holland? Or no, it was Basigalupo. Holland just made a go at Basigalupo for fourth position, and it didn't pay off. This was down into the chicane. Just came from a good run, it looks like. Got beside him. Vasigalupo fought it all the way to the end. And the outside momentum paid off. Looks like Munoz has since pitted. Uh, Ignacio Fredes also in. There you see Munoz just now coming out. As expected, Acosta easily by him. But Munoz ahead of Eisler. So thankfully not able to be jumped by the 727. Oh, Alquin, who is having such a good race. Oh, and you know what? Was this a lapped car ahead of him? Yes, it was. It was Jose Malbron who has an incident right in front of him. And actually, multiple cars hit Malbron. It wasn't just uh, Fredes. Or excuse me, Calquin, rather. And Calquin's in the pits now, too. It's got heavy damage. Fernando Borda absolutely plows into him. This is Malbron that we're watching who kicked off all of this. It was just close enough on the racing line. Both drivers had no recourse. Falcon actually got stuck in the wall out of that. Happened so close in front of him. There's just there's just no way you can change your line quick enough to do anything about that. That's 
That's so unfortunate. And if you're the person who makes that mistake and then you collect others, you just feel so bad about it because you know it was kind of a solo mistake. And it's it's just that corner is dangerous. It really is. Well, right now, Diaz is dangerous because he's finally going for the lead. He's been waiting a long time. I am guessing that this is when he is going to choose to pit. We've seen drivers do this repeatedly. Wait and save fuel, get aggressive, and no, it's the reverse. Diaz stays out, and it's Garrido who pits. And that's, that's exactly why I was thinking that Diaz was trying to save fuel. I'm almost certain that he was very close to getting this next lap in, and that's why he kept... He kept dropping back, and he, he's probably saved just enough to do this next lap, and then he'll pit. Looking at a battle for 13th, I'm keeping half an eye also on Acosta. Remember, he was racing with Garrido just behind him, so he could wind up jumping him, and it could be Obsidian 1-2 today, up and over turn 5. Delica just ahead of Romig. Delica had so much action today. Acosta's coming through, and he is going to jump Garrido. He is well by. The gap flattening out to just about a second between Acosta and Garrido. And that's, that's the kind of strange disadvantage of being the leader right there. And yet the strange powers as well of Abner Acosta... He's been employing this strategy every single race, and nobody seems to really be using it, except potentially you could say Diaz, who's coming in now. He's starting to learn from his teammate, and based on what we saw with Garrido, Acosta might actually jump his teammate as well. I think it might be close. I feel like Diaz is going to have a, a pretty short stop compared to the other two, though. I, I, I think he'll... He'll come out in the lead. It's just a question as to how much he'll come out in the lead by. He's hit his stall. Our pole sitter taking his fuel while Acosta comes around the final corner. Diaz is going. seconds for Acosta. Oh, it's longer for Diaz. It's 14 seconds. But where is Acosta? He's just behind him right now. And Diaz manages to take the lead. His teammate, though, right behind him. And now the question is, can, can Garrido get back to this pair? And can he then sort of play himself back into this fight? We know they're all good on fuel to the end now. Garrido's actually lost time to Acosta since that first lap out. It's It was one second. It is now up to two seconds. Ooh, that it doesn't go well for him. He definitely looks like he's pushing hard as well, so that, that might have induced a mistake. Back down to that battle for 13th. Been distracted by the leaders, but Derlicka, Romig, LeBlond, and Thurman. In fact, I'd say Thurman, LeBlond, and Henriquez are the much closer fight right now. Henriquez looking like he's going to try and challenge down into the inside of three. This is a tough pass to make. But it looks like Enriquez is tough enough. He takes 16th with that move. That is a very aggressive move. Great job on pulling it off and, and not losing the car there. He was heavy over the curb, and now he's actually having to look for the uh, 14th. There's something... Derlick had disappeared. I'm not sure if this was a... Uh, there was a, an issue or if he had a connection problem. He's manually disconnected, so I think maybe he hit something. Let's see here. Oh, there's a there's an absolutely bizarre incident. Actually, you know what? Delica had the exact same thing happen to him that did before, where he spun in the S's, except this time he hit the incident limit, it looks like, because he just went away in a puff of smoke. Yeah, and we've seen him kind of have issues all night, really, as well. So it's unfortunate to kind of run out of incidents on that, but honestly, not not too surprising. Well, I, I guess if you're going to go out, go out in style. So at least it wasn't a simple one off into the grass and disappear. It was a big hit into the wall. As we're watching the battle for fifth place, this is Eisler 
who's managed to get himself into the top five through pit stops and pace. And behind him, that is Anthony Pisano still giving chase. Don't forget about Bassigalupo in seventh, not far behind. Right on board with Pisano, looking ahead. Ferrari dominance is still continuing as Peterson is the first non-Ferrari in ninth place riding in a Porsche. I believe that was a lap car that we saw just spin on the exit of Juan. Staying with it down through the valley. Pisano's within half a second here. He started this race in 11th. Even bigger climb than we saw from Eitzler, who started P8. So from 11th to 6th for the 255. Behind them, Lu uh, Luis Enriquez. We were watching this battle before. It's LeBlanc. He's working on this time down into turn one, slowing both of them up. Thurman could take the position back. Not quite there, though. They all get back in line. LeBlanc 14th, Enriquez 15th, and Thurman 16th. Yeah, we see some really aggressive moves from all the guys in this group, actually. It doesn't... Oh, oh LeBron made a slight mistake there. Enriquez it looks like he's going to have an opportunity. He chooses the outside. I'm not sure how that's going to work for him. Yeah, well, be, that'll be tough, even in turn six with all the banking. Looks for the over-under. Nothing doing there. Maybe here in turn seven, LeBlanc looking to get the power down, but so is Enriquez. And even with the car swarming, he gets a great launch. He's in the slipstream. Now he's off to the side thinking he's got the momentum he needs. Defensive move from LeBron, holding off the inside down to the chicane. Porsche versus Ford. As they gather up speed, 160 miles an hour, finally getting on the brakes. LeBron early on them and giving up the ghost. Meanwhile, second place has changed hands, and that is because Acosta has gone off. The first crack in the armor we've seen all race, all season long. Oh, and it wasn't a crack in the armor. It was contact. Garrido getting into the back of him. Wild developments here. Garrido continuing his, his reputation as an aggressive driver. I almost wonder, though, if the stewards are going to talk to him about this one. Yeah, I mean, he goes for the inside, and I mean... He, he did kind of have position, but I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't want to be the one to make the call on that. He makes contact back to front, though. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. You're the trailing car. <laughs> I, 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 he's going to have a hard time, I think, explaining himself on that one. But it does give him second place with damage on the front of the car, mind you. And he's three and a half seconds back from our leader, Diaz. I think that's kind of, unfortunately for Acosta, it has actually helped his teammate Diaz by giving him that, that big buffer. That's a good point. Acosta, who is our points leader, suddenly finds himself running in fourth, though this will limit the damage with him being able to return to the track without losing too many places. But it's a, a number of spots that he has now lost on Diaz with only a five point gap in the championship. What's going on with Fred is here? Riding in a top 10 currently, having qualified P14. Glad for his fans to be able to get a glance at that car. Let's take a look at Anthony Pisano and Christian Eisler once more. They've dropped Basigalupo, who doesn't seem to be able to hold on to this battle. Eisler still holding down P5. Speaking of that, Basigalupo is actually sliding slightly backwards towards Holland now. We saw Holland fighting with him not too long ago in this race. This could be round two. Starting to wonder, just thinking about that incident with Garrido and Diaz, or with Garrido and Acosta, if last week it was with Diaz, I have a feeling that the Obsidian team is becoming not the greatest of fans of Garrido. Yeah, and, and that does that does kind of play into the mindset of how all the drivers on that team will now race that driver. And it's it's kind of unfortunate that that's how it works out, but that's that's just that's, that's just how game. it is, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're on teams with people and you build perceptions that way. 
Meanwhile, down in the mid-pack, LeBlanc and Thurman having a fight as they come through turn three and down into the S's one more time. This is for P14. Thurman closing up under braking as they climb over the hill of turn five, but loses ground on the exit. They gained a position because Borda has come in. Or is this his second stop or is this his first stop? It's gotta be his second stop. I don't know how he would be able to get this far. Uh, it's a very late stop if it is his first one. I, I feel like it probably is his second. It's a great one down the back stretch. Thurman in that bimmer, closing in to the rear of James LeBlond. Now he ducks off to the right side. LeBlond looking to defend into the chicane, but the extra speed means that Brett Thurman easily takes it into the braking zone, promotes himself to 14. I think LeBlanc is just struggling a little bit here. We saw that he was fighting with Enriquez and he's kind of left them a little bit. And there's, there's not really any threat now behind LeBlanc. So maybe he's just taking, taking a kind of easy, easy route to the end of the race here. Let's run you down our top 10 real quickly since the pit stops are over at this point. Michael Diaz is back up to the lead. Started on pole and was in the front for part of the time, but then Garrido took it away, decided, well, if that's the way it's going to be, I'll save fuel. Did so very well. Came back out in front. And behind him, it was Acosta, but now it's Garrido in second. Contact with Acosta has given Diego P2, but with a damaged car, it doesn't look like Munoz is catching too quickly because of the damage on his nose. Munoz still running in third himself about four and a half seconds behind. Other than some action early on, he settled into this podium position thanks to the incident ahead and is looking to spray the champagne if he can hold on. Acosta behind him. The contact in six and seven has thrown him down into fourth place. His rival, his teammate, Diaz, is gonna gain a lot of points and probably uh, bring this close to being tied once again between them. Then you get to P5, and it is Christian Eisler in the 727 we mentioned earlier, qualifying in eighth position, moving forward up to a top five. Not a bad race today for the Iceman. What's the next five look like, Christian? Well, we've got Pisano and Basigalupo in sixth and seventh, and they've, they've kind of had a good night as well. They're up a couple of spots each. And then we've got David Holland. He's also moved up a few spots. This kind of whole group has, has been together all night, and they've all kind of picked up about three to four positions each. And then my, my personal favorite of the evening, the, the first non-Ferrari in 10th place, uh, like ninth place, sorry, Leif Peterson. I feel like he's doing a great job. And then we've got Ignacio for Fredes. He's, he's up in 10th. He's had a quiet night, but again, up four spots himself. That's your top 10. And uh, just outside of him is one of our hard chargers, Elijah Mitchell, qualified 19th up to 11, eight positions gained for the number 149. Another one of our Porsches, actually, the second Porsche in the field, I believe, at the moment. He's got 10 minutes to go to try and hold on to this. It might not be a top 10, but still uh, a good climb forward for him. We were watching as, you, as Christian was giving his rundown, the latter half at the top 10. Pisano is threatening. He gave a little bit of a challenge to Eisler last time down into the chicane. Don't think he's going to get a chance again this time. Eisler's got a bit of a fight on his hands. Yeah, definitely. We got Pisano's pretty close to him here. I think he's definitely going to make a make a go for this in, in kind of the closing laps here, especially considering it's for that fifth fifth spot. I know a lot of guys like to chase top 10s, top 5s, and so on, so it's definitely worth something to him to get there. Iser managed his first podium of the season last round and at Road America. Sana's Ooh, got a good run a here. Run. He's looking to the he's inside, but he's not brave enough for turn one. Yeah, a little too early still for those kind of moves, I think he's decided. But they do have lap traffic. This is Gary Schilling in front of them, and they're catching him in towards space. No place to get out of the way, except maybe through here. One gets by, two gets by. Woo -hoo. Awful tight, but both drivers successfully threw. Pisano didn't even lose time in it. Seventh place looking hot, and Vasigalupo with Holland. Did he get that, or is he ahead of him? I think he was ahead of him. Yes, he was. He was ahead of uh, Holland last time we checked. All right, coming on to the backstretch, though. 
Here comes Holland. Might be a little too far back here though, especially with the draft of the lap car ahead. He's reeling in. It's coming down. It's down to about a car length between them. But now they hit the braking zone. And look at that late defensive move from Basigalupo. I, th I think I think he felt like he was safe and then kind of at the last minute decided that maybe he was just about under threat and went to defend it, but uh, it didn't really help him, if I'm honest. This is the highest fight we've got on track and it's 4 6th place currently. Pisano actually... Uh, oh, I, I take that back. Pisano and uh, Eisler is the highest battle. Holland and Basiglupo for 7th place, excuse me. Those two only about two seconds behind Pisano and Eisler, though I should note, because if they start fighting, it could become a four-car battle. And the lap traffic is definitely playing into this as well. It might even bring both these groups together. Interesting to note that there is only 15 cars left on the lead lap. There we see Pisano trailing Eisler as they go by the lap car of Lowen Dick. Once again... Pisano not quite close enough to affect anything. Holland with a big run, though. It. Holland's going to the outside. He's going to try it here. Defensive move there from Basigalupo. I don't know if he has it. Last time he managed to defend it, doing this very thing as the car squirms under power, trying to carry the speed. Doesn't look quite as effective, though, because Holland has the inside down for this corner. Nearly shoves him off course. And both of them managed to come out the other side, but that gives Holland seventh place. Yeah, it's very tight through there. And it's the second time we've seen that tonight with cars making contact in that last corner. And yet we've had nobody shoved into that outside wall, which is incredibly unforgiving. Woo! Wow. That looks incredible from that angle. <laughs> it's amazing that Vasigalupo wasn't shoved into the concrete. He still stays with him about three tenths of a second behind. And that could just uh, motivate him to try and get that spot back even more in these final five minutes. We got my favorite of the evening. Peterson is actually playing himself into this. He's not too far behind if they keep fighting. Absolutely. Elite Peterson less than a second behind Basigalupo because of that side-by-side -side action. More lap traffic that they have to deal with. Donald Olsen this time. But two are going to get by. Three are not. That'll split Lee Peterson. Is this going to hold him up? I think he should get by on the front stretch, so it shouldn't hurt him too much. But we do have another car that's probably going to be in his way coming through the S's here. It's Lowendick. We saw him a little bit earlier. Olsen did let Peterson by on the front stretch nicely without getting in the way. Actually, uh, Basigalupo managed to get by quite well, and Peterson did not. That will definitely split them as he has to slow up behind Lowendick, the Ferrari up in front, just not quite as fast as Lee Peterson, but he'll pull off to the side. He sees the blue flags and allows the ninth place car through. I feel realistically that Peterson isn't quite as fast as this pair of Ferraris, but it's, it's all about being there if something does happen and being there to take advantage of that. For those wondering what's going on between Diaz and Garrido, Garrido does seem to be struggling with the damage on the nose of his Ferrari because it is six seconds that he has fallen back. Remember, it was about three at first after the incident. There you see the 317 on your screen. Still looking for his first win of the season. Unfortunately, looks like he'll be denied once more. Also, Acosta is slipping further back now, actually. He's almost in range of Eisler. Acosta's got to have some damage of his own. I wonder if that's what's allowing Eisler to close in. But I don't think Eisler is looking in front. I think he's looking behind at this point because Pisano continues to apply immense pressure on that 727. Yeah, Pisano is definitely, definitely within range and definitely going to make a play for this at the end, I think. It, it just 
it's one of those things though where you can see that you're catching a caster and you know that both of you can get past him if you get there so might be better to work together just for another lap or two just to see if that that position's available does bump drafting work in these cars down long stretch i've seen it done i wouldn't recommend it myself <laughs> Uh, I mean, you being on the old side, you've had experience with bump drafting, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've also been on the wrong end of it as well, when people don't know how to do it properly, so there's that. That's true. Well, let's see whether they try to work together or if this is all bets are off in the final two laps of the race. So, right now, Diaz, actually, I think will be... Yeah, I think he'll get the white flag next time by, because he's coming up to turn six right now. So, on to the back stretch for the number 30. He won the first round. It was his first win of the series. It took him a whole season to finally get one while his teammate won the championship last season. We said from early on, it looked like Diaz was going to be challenging Acosta for that championship. He fights back once more. After a bad result at Road America, we got some action with Holland Basic Lupo. Because look at this, onto the back stretch. This is the closest we've seen Lucas. What can he do with this run? Holland just ahead of him, took it by force. Is it going to be just as forceful back down the back stretch? Defensive move. And Basigalupo, we've seen, has been good on the other side, coming out of the chicane. Does he look for the over-under, potentially? He breaks earlier, and if he did, it didn't work. He does get a good shot off of the final chicane and onto the front stretch, but it is not quite enough. And I think Holland is being really careful here to make sure that he doesn't have the reverse of, of what he did back to him, because uh, if I was Basigalupo, I wouldn't be happy about how that last corner went, and I'd definitely want to be the person on the inside the next time we went through there side by side. Oh, Leif Peterson! He's made a mistake! Oh no, after his good run. Now, he's still in ninth, and it looks like Fredes is still well behind him, so I don't think he lost the spot. Yeah, it looked like he just went slightly too deep into the, into the top of the hill, and I think he kept it out of the wall. And we need to come back live because our leader oh, is baby. coming out of the final corner. Michael Diaz is going to take victory, his second of the season, to match his teammates here at Road Atlanta. Garrido, once again, with controversial incidents on track, winding up with a second place ahead of a well-earned podium from Munoz. I don't know how Acosta is going to feel about this one. And, well, he's actually very close to Eisler. Is he out of fuel? He might actually lose his spot, and he does! At the line! Eisler takes it away from him. Fourth place, Acosta settles for fifth, even. I wonder if the damage hurt his fuel mileage. It definitely would have done, and, man, that's, that hurts. That's, that's like, the, the worst way to have your evening end right there. Riding on board, let's listen to his engine. When it starts to sputter on him, he's already coasting here, so he knows he's tight. On oh, there, it starts to sputter. He tries to cover off the inside to make it the shortest line possible. Oh, my goodness. Eisler's going to be happy about that with the fourth place. I can tell you that Peterson, uh, Peterson wound up with an eighth. How did that happen? Holland had something happen to him at the end, and I'm checking to see if I can find it. I feel like there might have been contact between him oh, and Oh, there was. Lupo. There was, and it, it, it did involve contact, except in weird circumstances, he was the car on the inside like before, except he's the one that gets spun around. I need to back up just a little farther. I don't think he was trying to do the same thing again and, and get aggressive, but... Wow. Well, that is that is some sweet karma for Basagalupo in that situation. 
Yeah, I mean, it looked, it, it looked like he gave enough space. He was quite far on the outside, and just Holland didn't quite uh, manage to keep it going there. Uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to one of them about that uh, in the post-race. Not sure that we will. We'll come back and get those interviews very soon, as well as the unofficial results. But stick around, because on screen, you'll see all the upcoming races here on the GSRC. I racing you wanted the best. You got them for a rest. Often imitated, never duplicated. The greatest show on dirt. Welcome back to Road Atlanta, the virtual version of the track scene, real world sports car racing here this weekend. Saw some great action out on track between our front runners, Michael Diaz, one of them, managed to pull a note from his teammates, save some fuel and take victory, tying him on wins with his teammate Garrido, second place and still winless, had some contact with Acosta late in the race after losing his uh, lead with that pit strategy. Paulo Munoz, uh, we were talking after the race and during the break, a very calm, quiet third place for him, at least in the latter half of it. Uh, Christian Eisler, a surprise fourth right at the line. There was one tenth between himself and Abner Acosta, who not only had that contact and not only found himself bumped down the order, but eventually ran out of fuel right at the line. He was just ahead also of Anthony Fasano, who took sixth place. Lucas Basigalupo with a seventh and a fight at the end. He got shoved off for his position and uh, actually had contact again at the end, except he wasn't the one being pushed around. It was uh, 
uh, Holland who got spun on that second contact. Peterson finished behind him in eighth with David Holland finishing ninth after he unfortunately loses spots with just a corner to go. And Ignacio Rodriguez Fredes finishes P10. Then in the 11th, we had Luis Henriquez. He was in a lot of fights tonight. Started 6th, fell down in 11th, but I feel like he'll be pretty happy with how he kind of bounced back. We saw him pulling some pretty good moves towards the end of the race. 12th, we got Elijah, Elijah Mitchell. Didn't really talk too much about him, but came home with, well, a gain of 7 positions in 12th. So, a pretty good night for him. Sean Romig, similar again. Quiet night, 23 to 13th. So, position gain of 10. Good job by him. We saw Brett Thurman having a bit of bit of a fight being involved with those uh, with those battles with James LeBlanc near the end there and those guys they did a good job as well coming home in 14th and 15th. And the first car off the lead lap we had Sean G uh, Hamel and Ted Lowendick with uh, Kenneth Rodriguez and Do uh, Donald Olsen behind them. And then 20th we had Stacey Dunnigan with a pretty quiet night but a gain of 12 positions. And 21st, it was Francisco Yaniselli. And 22nd goes to Spencer Simkovich. Then we get to the cars that had big problems. Jeff Carrillo, 23rd uh, with the DNF today. Fernando Borda as well. Jose Malbron managed to get back out on track, but he was 25th by the end. Jesper Derlicka uh, was actually DQ'd due to too many incidents. 26th position, Horacio Calquin got stuck in the wall. Gary Schilling, 28th. Timothy Hargrave in 29th, top 30, rounded out by Christopher Pfeiffer. Last two cars were Mark File, Frederico Montini, Joey Trungale, and Jonathan Almanar with James Hebb being a did not start today. Up first, we have Michael Diaz, uh, our winner here for this race. Michael, I, I had been saying before, I'm surprised nobody else has been trying to pull the move that your teammate has, a uh, uh, cost of saving fuel, and then taking the win that way. And it looks like you've been paying attention. Uh, hi guys. Uh, yeah, it seems to work for him. So I decided to try it out today. I guess it does work. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, it worked a treat. You came in, you had a quick stop and as soon as you exited the pits, did you know that you were uh, back out in the lead? Uh, yeah, I had a buddy spotting me and he even told me just, uh, put extra fuel in cause you're clear. So I did that. If not, Maybe I could have had like a little bit more room to breathing room up front. But yeah, I was pretty sure I would come up out, out front. Now behind you, there was a little bit of controversy because uh, Diego, unfortunately, set your teammate back. Were you two in contact uh, over comms during the race? Uh, and did he tell you what happened? Uh, yeah, we were in contact. He was uh, fuming, like you can probably guess uh i don't know maybe diego's trying to take our team out or something <laughs> last week it was me this week is avner uh, let's see what happens uh, we even made con uh, comment on that that the obsidian team does not seem to be becoming a fan of diego well regardless you managed to take the win for the team uh, uh this week congratulations and hopefully we'll get to talk to you in a week's time again yeah thanks guys uh shout out to butt kicker for sponsoring the the series also simsa and my team on Mivano Racing, uh, this is for you. That was our winner, Michael Diaz, taking the victory after starting on pole. Up next, we have Diego Garrido, and uh, his friend Pablo Valenzuela is translating for him. Christian? Yeah, Diego, looked like it was a, a pretty good night in terms of pace. We saw you fighting for the win for the majority of the race. Came home second. Are you disappointed in that? Diego, eh, te preguntan si estás contento con la segunda ubicación que obtuviste. Eh, la verdad es que sí, pero lamentablemente me deja un poco decaído el toque con Abner Acosta. Pero bastante contento. Yeah, um, Diego is uh, pretty uh, happy with the result but uh, he um, it's like um, uh, not not too happy with the incident with uh, Avner at all um, just was uh, kind of bad luck um, uh, contact yeah we did see that through on the broadcast and it was a little difficult to kind of understand really what happened uh, is there anything you'd like to say about 
kind of how he felt in that incident. Um, Diego, hay algo que tú eh, quieras, eh, algo que tú sientas acerca del incidente o cómo viste el incidente desde tu punto. Bueno, eh, desde mi punto venía muy pegado en la entrada de la curva y quería intentar un sobrepaso, pero perdí la, la referencia de frenada. Yeah, um, just was, uh, he has, uh, he really had the pace and he just saw that could be a little space to do a maneuver and just kind of lost the reference on the breaking point and just make the contact, but not intentionally. Yeah, it, de it definitely looked like it was, it was just a racing deal from from my perspective and once again i mean a, a great job coming home second we saw he picked up a little bit of damage from that and going into the next round how how, how confident is he on maybe picking up a win okay um diego cuan eh cuánto es la confianza que hay para la próxima carrera que viene en relación a poder ganar la carrera bueno eh el tema es que voy a estar en Italia compitiendo en, en el Mundial de Karting. Entonces no voy a poder asistir a las próximas fechas, pero mi idea es volver con todo para poder ganar. Uh, yeah, he will be like um pretty confident for the next round, but he will be racing on the World uh, Karting Championship on uh italy so he will miss uh the next round so but he will be come back with a strong a strong as ever and try to fight for that win uh that's that's great to hear i mean we've we've seen he's been very fast so it's great to have him back and before we let both of you go is there anyone that you'd like to thank for for this result okay Um, entonces, Diego, ¿hay alguien a quien quieras eh, agradecer por este resultado? Eh, a mis tutores y los que me han enseñado bastante, Pablo Valenzuela, Christian Eisler, y con el que juego casi todos los días, Horacio Calquín. Yeah, he, he wants to, like, thanks uh, everyone that he have been supporting him, uh, to get into sim racing. Uh, he's pretty new at it. Um, that is uh, Christian Eisler and uh, Horacio Calkin and me to try to keep him over here and teach him like like the a good way to be in, in a good uh, pace for the races. Well, thanks for translating for us, Pablo. That was Diego Garrido, who uh, took second today. Uh, another podium for him. And of course, uh, we want to thank a few people ourselves. We want to thank our sponsor, Simulation Motorsports Affinity, who can be found at simsa.net. If you want to get involved with sim racing worldwide, they are the ones to contact. Also, a big thank you goes out, of course, to Butt Kicker for the prizes that they are providing for the second season in a row. Uh, you can check them out at thebuttkicker.com. Also, thank you goes out to iRacing for putting us on IESN for another season of the GTE series. It's been exciting each and every time, and that's why we highly encourage you to subscribe so that you don't miss a moment here in the PRL GTE series. Thanks to the companies that provide the software and the hardware for our broadcasts that are listed here on your screen. And additional thanks go to June Lalonde, who provides our wonderful music. See the screen for how to get a hold of more of her great work. Thanks to the team today, Christian, Sean, and Dougie. If you'd like to find out more about GSRC, including upcoming races, you can find it at GlobalSimRacingChannel.com. Also, check us out on social media. Twitter is at GSR Channel, Facebook, Global Sim Racing Channel, and Instagram, GSRC underscore Gram. The next race, it's going to be a very different track from what we saw off Road Atlanta. Circuit of the Americas, a lot of runoff, but still very tricky. That'll be Tuesday, October 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We have upcoming races for other series listed on the screen, so check those out and mark them down on your calendar. But until next time, race clean, race hard, and we'll see you on the track.